Cystic Fluoriasa and Certain Accident Repairs. And the first talk of this session will be on Certain Accident Repairs. Zero, one loss, and it's given by the Okay, so in the first three slides, what are certain answers, what are zero one laws, and how they meet, and then details. Okay. It's not a philosophy talk. Okay, so what's incomplete database? So an incomplete database in general, it's some compact representation of many complete databases. So there are many ways to complete, provide meaning to, uh, to, it, to various incompleteness or uncertainty. And the way we sort of learn in the theory community to answer queries uh, against incomplete databases, let's say here we have incomplete database D and it has like all these, can denote all these potentially infinitely many different databases D sub i's. And the way we learn to answer queries to them is to give a certain answer. Say tuple is a certain answer to a query Q in, in an incomplete database D. If it is an answer in every single, in, 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 to Q in every single database D sub i. Okay? So it's a very nice notion, very natural. The problem is that it's, um, that it's uh, hard computationally. For instance, under the most standard model of incompleteness, it will be coin P hard for relational calculus queries. So what are zero-one laws? Imagine that you have f some formula, some sentence over graphs, and then you look at the numeration of all the graphs, and in some of them uh, it's true, in some of them it's false, like green means it's true, false means it's false, uh, it's, it, red means it's false. And we say that the sentence is almost surely valid if it's true in almost all graphs, right? So that's the idea behind a zero-one law. And so, so basically what we do technically, we just say pick a graph at random, calculate the probability mu of alpha such that alpha is true in such a randomly picked graph, and then if mu of alpha is one, if alpha is almost, if that means that alpha is almost surely valid. And the classical result, and uh, to anyone who loves beauty, I absolutely recommend the proof of that result as well, by Fagin 1976, says that if alpha is the first of the sentence, that this mu of alpha is either zero or one, right? And there have been lots of generalizations, some of them by distinguished logicians in this audience, right? So, and so basically, another thing to notice here, that if you, if you wanna check if alpha is valid, that is true in all graphs, it's an undecidable problem. But we want to check whether alpha is almost surely valid. That is actually fairly easy to decide this space, to be more precise. So how do they meet? Well, the idea is this. So now we have infinitely many databases that an incomplete database can represent. And the idea is a little bit like this zero and loss. So we just say pick a complete database at random, right? And if I have a tuple, then I just want to say A that might be in an answer to a query, I want to calculate the probability that this alpha belongs to the answer to Q in a randomly picked database that is represented by an incomplete database. All right, okay, so I shouldn't be walking. What? Oh, okay, okay, technology, that's wonderful. Okay, uh, so, and then if this measure, if this probability that, alpha, that, uh, that A is an answer in a randomly picked database is one, then it means that it's an almost certainly true answer to Q in Z, right? But then, so what kind of questions you would ask here? Well, obviously, when is it the case, right? When is this probability one? And how easy it was to compute that this probability is one? Or can an answer be, say, 50% true, right? Or can, uh, if in another way, like say, if I have two tuples, can I say that one tuple is a more likely answer than another tuple, right? So that's sort of questions that I want to answer here, right? And of course, it does not work as advertised, but the buttons still do work. Okay, so first of all, in what is the model in which I work? So in this paper, I work in the standard model of marked nulls, which is very, very common. It's a standard model that we use in Relational databases generalize SQL nulls with some caveats, and it's used in lots of applications such as data integration, data exchange uh, that Vokian was talking about yesterday, OBDA, and so on, right? So the idea is that I have some nulls in the database denoted by this bottom symbol, and then I have variations that simply style constant values to nulls, and then I sim apply this variation to get the databases that could represent this incomplete database, right? So here I replace null one by null one, null two by two, and so on, and I just plug them in. 
right? So what are certain answers? Say if I have a tuple of constants, then it is a certain answer if it will be in the result of Q on every such database. Apply any evaluation to the database, and the tuple should be in the answer. And there is a slight generalization of that due to Lipsky, which I think should be the right definition, but unfortunately it was first definition that he gave. And then he forgot it, people forgot it and started only using the definition with constants. And this says that for arbitrary tuples that may contain nulls, it should be the case if I take any evaluation and apply it to the tuple, it should be in the result of the query queue when I apply this evaluation to the database. But you can just think of the usual constant definition that tuple is in the, result, in, in the answer in all the databases. Right? And so using that, I can define support of an answer, potential answer tuple. Right, which is all the valuations V such that this condition holds. Right, so I just look at all the valuations and say, okay, does it witness that my tuple is in the answer to the query or not? If it does, it's in the support. Close world now. Close world. So if you, if you notice, like back here, right? So, yeah, so back here, it, it is close world. So I don't extend that. So, so then an answer is certain if every evaluation is in the support. And the idea is that to say that an answer is almost certainly true if a randomly chosen evaluation is in the support. Okay, there is a small problem. There are infinitely many evaluations, but so I cannot just say randomly chosen evaluation save is uh, uniformly at random, but uh, basically what I can do, I can just do the same thing as people do in zero one laws, and I can look at find approximations. So to be more precise, let me enumerate the set of constants somehow, and I look at valuations for each k, I look at valuations such that the range of them is the first k constants in this enumeration. And then I simply restrict the support to this first two valuations with this restricted domain, and look at the ratio of the valuations in the support restricted to the first k elements to number of all valuations of is that range, right? So the interpretation is that this is a probability that randomly chosen valuation with this range of the first k elements in, in, of the first k constants witnesses that A is an answer to Q. And then how do I get rid of this k? The same thing as zero one loss. I just take the limit of this as k goes to infinity. Right? And that's the interpretation of that is a probability that randomly chosen valuation witnesses that A is an answer to Q. Of course, the trivial lemma that you prove that it does not, for any reasonable query, it does not depend on the exact evaluation because eventually everything will be, all, all the domain of the database will be there and it does not matter what happens afterwards in the limit. And so that's my measure. So what's the first result I can prove about this? So let's say take Q is any reasonable query for hardcore post people, that means generic or even C generic for some final set of constants C. So, but roughly in, invariant under isomorphic and the permutation of the domain. So essentially think of any query in any reasonable language, take relational algebra, data log, second order logic, whatever, right? And then this number that I've just defined is going to be either zero or one, right? So the zero one law in this case. So in other words, any answer will be either certainly, almost certainly true, almost certainly false. So when is it going to be almost certainly true? It's almost certainly true if and only if this answer is returned by the naive evaluation of the query on the database, right? So that tells you that the certainly true answers are much easier to compute the, the, than, than, than almost certainly true answers, are much easier to compute than certain answers, okay? So what's naive evaluation? Naive evaluation that treats nulls as constants, right? So like here, if I take the difference of these two databases, I notice that the tuple one null one is present in the first one, but not in the second, so it goes in the output but say two null one is present in both of them, so it doesn't go in the output and so on. Just the usual database evaluation, right? And so what's the sort of intuition here? So in certain answers in this case is actually empty, right? Because let's say what if I take evaluations that sends both nulls to the same constant, then these two relations become identical. The difference of them is the empty set and the certain answer is empty. But if you just think of that, if the range of all the nulls is uh, infinite, right? And I take this and I randomly choose their values, then such evaluations are not very likely. And so in the limit, they will disappear, right? And that, that means that, so the return tuples that I have here, so they are almost certainly true answers. They're not certain, but in most cases, they, in most evaluations, for most evaluations of nulls, they will, be, they will be in the answer. So of course, in general, naive evaluation is not the same as certain answers, if it's just so, but actually, 
In fact, there are quite a few queries. We know some fairly large class of queries when they to coincide. For instance, I can take unions of conjunctive queries and even extend them with a relational division, and uh, then still naive evaluation will give me certain answers. OK. So far, so good. So it looks like this naive evaluation that people very often use without even thinking you know, what, wh whether it makes sense or not, it's actually not so arbitrary, right? It gives you things that are almost certainly true. Only uses generalist, nothing else. But what, for instance, if I have some constraint? What if I tell you that A is a key of the second relation that will actually force the, uh, the equality of the, sorry, sorry, of the first, it should be of the first relation, uh, that forces the equality of null 1 and null 2? What happens if I just tell you that B, for instance, there is a foreign key from B into some relation and B can only take five values, right? Then suddenly this reasoning that the valuations that send null 1 and null 2 to the same value are not, this, this reasoning is, not, is, is no longer valid. Right? It's no longer valid due to the presence of constraints. So we want to look at what happens with the certainty when we have constraints. Let's say we have a set of constraints, like say keys, foreign keys, and we want to, uh, what usually people do in incomplete information, they look at implication. Right? They look at Certainty of implication uh, that um, uh, of implication that uh, that constraints imply the query, but actually that's not very informative in this case. So in fact, you can just show that it's you know this in this case the measure of this implication is either one or is the same as the certainty of the query queue itself. But here this approach actually lets us look at lets us do a finer analysis, and what we can do instead we can look at conditional probability. We can look at probability that a randomly chosen valuation that satisfies constraints also witnesses that A is an answer to the query. Right? That's a much more reasonable measure. And it's easy to define it. So we, again, we look at the supports. Right? And we look at the ratio. Again, we restrict to K to the, to, to the first K elements of the K, K constants. And then we look at the ratio of query conjunction of query and constraints, uh, and, the, and just the support for the constraints themselves. So in other words, what we look at is the probability of the randomly chosen valuation that satisfies sigma, else witnesses that A is an answer to Q. Right? And again, we take the limit of this. Right? So that's, that's our conditional probability of Q given sigma. Right? So in the limit. Now, what do we know about this? So if you Zero one law fails, but what's the best thing we can get if zero one law fails is convergence. So we know that this, if again I take any generic query, any generic set of constraints, and this limit always exists, right? So we do have convergence. So it is a rational number between zero and one. So we can compute this limit in this class uh, FP to the sharp P, uh, which is functional polynomial time with sharp P oracles. And it's a uh, could be, it, computing it could be hard for this class under some reasonable notion of hardness for functional classes. And also, every rational number in 0, 1 can appear this way. Can appear, in fact, can appear this way when QRQ is, is conjunctive and uh, sigma contains just inclusion constraints. Right? So we have the next best thing after 0 and low, so we have convergence. Well, sometimes what happens is that with, for some constraints, uh, we can actually recover zero one law. For instance, we have, there are several in the, uh, classes in the paper, but one of them that I'll present here is functional dependencies. So if you have a set of functional dependencies, let's just look at what was known in the literature, right? So what was known in the literature is that if we want to find an answer to a conjunctive query, a certain answer to conjunctive query under functional dependencies, what we do, we just chase the incomplete database with these dependencies, and then we apply the query, right? So now what we say is that let's take an arbitrary query, arbitrary generic query, and then the same equality is true, except that now I have to say that it's almost certainly true answers to query Q under sigma that will be obtained this way, right? So I can use the same trick as we use for conjunctive queries, and the only difference now is that I get queries which are true with answers which are true with probability one. Okay. So I can also use this framework to define qualitative measures. So uh, again, if I look at supports, so I can define qualitative measures. And I say, for instance, that A is at least as good an answer as B to query Q on D. If A has 
at least as much support as B. So every evaluation that witnesses that B is an answer has to witness that A is an answer. I can say that A is a better answer than B, right? If A is the support of A is strictly bigger than the support of B. And I can say that A is the best answer if there is no better answer. Right? So let's just me give an, let me give you an example. So again, the same uh, difference query between the two databases. So it has no certain answers as before. We saw before that naive evaluation gives us these two tuples, one null one, this first tuple, and two null two. But actually, in this case, you can analyze this example and see that two null two is a better answer than one null one. So there are more evaluations that will witness that. So in particular, in this case, it, is, it's, uh, it will be the best answer. So and unlike certain answers, the advantage of best answers is that unless your database is empty, they always exist by definition, right? Even certain answers are always empty and then say, what do I do? Well, you can always, you can go and find best answers, right? The best you can find under the circumstances. So what's the complexity of this? You know, this is pods. So if you introduce a concept, you have to come up with complexity results for it. So what's the complexity for it? Let's say here we'll do it for relational calculus, uh, relational algebraic calculus. It's actually the result in the paper is more general. Uh, say take, we take a date, look at data complexity, take a database and two tuples A and B, and say is A at least as good as B? That's coin P complete. Is A better than B? That's DP complete. And identify the set of best answers. That's this funny class uh, polynomial time with logarithmic number of NP oracles complete. So if you're not that familiar with these classes, the key point is they live very, very low in the polynomial hierarchy, in the second level of the polynomial hierarchy. So both of them live in uh, sigma P2 intersect pi P2. Right? What happens for unions of conjunctive queries? All of these become polynomial time. So if you ever work on incomplete information, you would just say, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. It's like everything about unions of conjunctive theories is polynomial time because I apply naive evaluation and it works. Actually, it doesn't. Naive evaluation has of no help here, so it's the algorithm of very different nature to show P time. Okay, so Elsa, how do these things qualitative versus quantitative combine? Uh, so, you know, with terms of quantitative measures, I can just say, you know, something is almost certainly true answer, or almost certainly false answer. If I look at qualitative measure, I can say that something is a best answer or something is not a best answer. And actually all four combinations are possible, right? So we can say that, you know, maybe the ultimate goal is to find best answers such that their measure on them is one, right? And uh, just to sort of leave you with a summary of what's, what's done here, so it's basically the key point is that this almost certainly true answers to queries, the concept of almost certainly true answers to queries on incomplete databases. These are answers that are very good, maybe not perfect, but very good, but then they behave much better computationally than the usual certain answers. Right. And so what to do in the future? Uh, there are obviously other data models. Right, so, and, uh, you know, I would like to see how these things they play with graphs and uh, past queries and things like that. So, uh, serious question here is, you know, what really happens with SQL nulls? So, SQL, we, we, we sort of say that mark nulls are, non-repeating mark nulls are SQL nulls. Well, there's a bit of a lie there, right? It's a it's, it's nice model, but it's not exactly SQL nulls, right? So, so, I would like to see what happens with real SQL nulls and, and SQL evaluations. So everything here was like in the original Ron Fagan's zero one law under uniform distribution. So obviously people in this, that field consider lots of other distributions. So here the question is what distributions make sense and what happens under them. And also how this approach would play in typical applications of certain answers. Let's say data exchange that Fokin was talking about, data integration or OBDA. All right, thanks. Moshe. What do you mean with open world? You mean this is closed world? No, yes. No, no, no. Clo closed world means that I simply replace nulls with constants, right? I have an infinite domain of constants. Okay, but closed world means that the set of constants is the one that's given you in the data. 
not not not, not in, in, in a, there are many closed worlds, right? So the clo closed, closed world. The, no, no, this is not closed closed world, right? This is the model here is that what people in complete information, let's say, starting from Emilian Skilipsky closed closed close world, right? Which is you have uh, you have an infinite set of of constants, say domain elements, right? And nulls can be substituted with those domain elements, right? Open world in the so again like uh, again using term. Yes, so like the, the, the original writer, writer's definition. Yes. No, in this case, if I can only, if I can only, repl if I can only replace the things from these constants from, uh, from the domain, right, already from the domain, then I'm, essentially that's going to give me inclusion constraints. So I'm going to get a rational number. I'm not going to get in general zero one law. I'm going to get a rational number. And uh, my guess is if I use this very restricted model, actually I don't think that's very relevant in this particular setting, but if I use that, I think that I'm, my intuition is that the complexity of finding this number could be lower than FP to the sharp P. But that's, that's intuition, I can promise you that. Yes, yeah. Well, you don't, you don't have functions here. So the idea is that, I mean, this is... You, you no, this functional, de functional dependence is actually easy. This functional dependence is you really just apply chase and you do the measure over chase, right? So it's, what, what, what really happens here, I mean, the reason you get rational numbers is that uh, you, 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 you actually go, you actually compute this, you know, you actually compute these expressions, right? You, you, you find an, you, if this, uh, this uh, numbers of, of uh, valuations, right? And you can show that for every fixed database, they become, they become polynomials, right? And then basically your, uh, yeah, and then exactly, you just look at leading, the ratio of leading coefficients. And, uh, you know, there, there are some combinatorics involved there, obviously, to prove that, so that's, yes. Yes, I, I, lo I looked at that paper, yes. And and they actually do an analysis formula. They, try, they do proof by induction. Mm -hmm. it's yes, yeah. Is yeah. To about the yes, uh, yes, and, and, and actually, and actually what, what you, yes. It's more relevant yeah. to this paper than, than, than the Fabian. Uh, Absolutely, and I have said that the proof in of that it's a rational number that kind of convergence in this case is actually clo much closer in the spirit to the Glebsky et al. than to Fagin. Absolutely, because I mean, I mean, you have to get your hands dirty. So there's kind of no magic that, like, you know, exactly like like what Ron did. Yeah, no, no, you get your hands dirty. You just find this. You just show that's polynomial, and then you take a ratio of leading coefficients. By the cardinality of support, I have no idea. That's a good question, actually. I have no idea. Martin? No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's.